Um, so everybody, this is uh, Nicola Pinzani from the University of Oxford. He's doing his Doctor of Philosophy in the Computer Science Department under the supervision, I believe, of Bob Koke and maybe also Stefano. I don't know if I'm wrong on yeah, that. Yeah, Stefano is a cosmic Okay, and he's going to be talking to us. They have a very interesting work. This is building on a previous uh, preprint and perhaps perhaps manuscript dealing with a uh, causality uh, within the sheaf theoretic framework of Abramsky and and collaborators. So, uh, Nicola, we're very interested to hear what you guys have to say. So you thank can you very much. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk about our work with you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk. What I'm, I'm gonna talk today about this joint work with with Stefano. Uh, it's based on this uh, big paper that we put on we put on the archive. It's called the Topology and Geometry of Causality. Um, it's yeah, it's yeah. Let me let me just get started. And so the talk is not gonna be uh, like it's not going to be uh, very mathematical. I plan to kind of you know. Uh, describe the more the important conceptual part of our framework. But if you have questions or anything, just uh, interrupt me at, at any time, really. Um, so before I like, okay. So before I explain what what we're actually doing, just a, a bit of motivation. So everyone who uh, works in you know classical causal modeling, uh, in relate with in relationship with quantum mechanics, stumbles upon the fact that. There are some problems that classical causal modeling some, some, somehow fails to explain quantum correlations. And what do I mean? Well, for example, the uh, causal explanations of the Bell inequality violation, okay, so where you have two space like separated agents, uh, they have their settings, uh, so X for Alice and Y for Bob, and then out comes A for Alice and B for Bob, and some shared common uh, resources. Uh, well, if you want to find a causal explanation of the correlation that arises from a Bell experiment, then there is a problem, you know, like the, um, uh, the, the causal model explaining the correlation will have to include some, you know, causal relationships. So, for example, from the settings of Bob and the outcome of Alice or the setting of Alice and the outcome of Bob, some extra arrows to the, to the DAG, which, however, they are very well fine-tuned in, in the sense that, okay, they represent a causal uh, influence in a way, but they don't allow for you know space like communication. So it's a kind of fine-tuned, strange causal explanation of what's really going on. We we really shouldn't be surprised that this is happening, right? You know, like the, all the kind of classical uh, classical causal modeling relies on the assumptions that you know there are some underlying causal mechanisms, some underlying causal functional mechanism correlating inputs and outputs. Which are then obfuscated by you know some uh, noise because there are some latent variables and stuff like that. But there exists this kind of global distribution of causal data, okay, which explains the the correlations. What we wanted to do is like understand like uh, understand really like what is going on from a kind of theory independent perspective, right? So we wanted to find an arena where we can place, we can study general correlations and, um, and we can study correlations in the presence of this signaling and also differentiate between correlations which are classical, correlations which are not classical and kind of generalize this idea of, of causal discovery. And it turns out that if you want to do so, it's really important to kind of unify contextuality and causality on kind of the same footing. And to do so, the shift theoretic approach was was I mean it used to be it it, it it like it it was a it, it is a kind of a very useful framework to do so. It already kind of unifies kind of non-locality and contextuality. We just add we we ext extended it and added uh, the discussion about uh, signaling and you know uh, different causal operational causal assumptions. So uh, before I explain what we do, just a brief uh, kind of uh, introduction to the shift theoretic approach. I don't know if everyone is, uh, knows about it. So we start with a kind of set of measurements, which we call, we call M, and a family of outcomes, one for every 
uh, measurement. Okay, we can also take it for simplicity to be constant across all the measurements. So just call it O if you wish. Then there is a measurement cover, so a choice, so a family of subsets of the set of measurements which cover the set of all the set of measurements, and it's downward closed. So if you have a set which is inside C prime and C prime is inside M, then C is E C itself would be inside curly M. Um, you can think about this measurement cover. This would also be useful for later on. You know, as a kind of you know you have you have this lattice of subsets of the set of measurements, uh, so the power set, if you want. And what you're really selecting is a, you know, anti-chain in this, in this lattice, right? It can be identified with, uh, with, uh, with uh, downward closed sets. Then you add a kind of sheaf of events, which associates to every subset of measurements, a set of joint outcomes. Okay, so the, the set of, of all the possible, but not possible in a possibilistic sense, the set of all the kind of definable joint outcomes. And then you post compose this with the distribution monad and effectively you get an assignment of distribution of joint outcomes for every set of, of measurements. So this is the, those are kind of the main ingredients of the, of the basic framework. Then we say that an empirical model, so a table correlating, you know, joint inputs with joint outputs, it's a compatible, it's a family of compatible section for us to, for this cover curly M. So what is this? You assign for every element of the cover one particular section of this pre-sheaf and of this assignment of, of distributions of, of outcomes in such a way that it's compatible, you know, with the downward closed structure. And uh, so this is kind of the non-disturbance condition, which in particular, you know, when you're studying uh, situations like non-locality, this amounts to no signaling really, right? Or non-disturbance for kind of more general contextuality scenarios. So we say that an empirical model is non-contextual or local or classical or however you want to call it, when, this compatible section, they all arise from an E, which is a global section, which is a section of, uh, of you know, this um, distribution of outputs assigned over all the measurements of your scenario. Okay, so you have this, uh, this description of uh, distribution of outcomes, one for each element of the cover. And then you say, okay, this is actually, it's arising from a, you know, a, it's a classical scenario when it arises from this uh, assignment of global hidden variables to all the measurements at the same time. So just to give a kind of brief description in case you, you, you were lost the mathematics. So this is an empirical model, this table. Uh, so the rows are indexed by this family of context that we choose, you know, all the kind of the set of measurements are given by A0, A1, B0, and B1. And in this case, we denote the context with these edges connecting the measurements that lie in the same context. And uh, this is a scenario when you have two agents, uh, Alice and Bob, they are space-like separated. And those are the possible contexts which are entailed by this uh, space-like separation. And suppose that they observe this kind of empirical behavior, okay? Uh, so this is a no signaling scenario. Probably most of you know it very well. It's the kind of PR correlations. But um, what is interesting is that you can kind of observe kind of topologically and visually it's non-classicality in a kind of glaring way, you know, like using this description in terms of Mandel diagrams where essentially you have these uh, edges, which denote the context, you assign the data on the top of these, of these edges. And here we have highlighted only the outcomes which, which can occur with an non-zero probability. And what we get is this kind of, uh, this, this picture that looks like a Moebius strip, right? And uh, this is immediately some, something strange you know, about this thing. Like if you are Alice and you measure zero and you know that Bob has measured zero, so you know, you know what, what to expect from, from this out of this context. And let's say that you observe the outcome zero. Okay, then you deduce, okay, well, certainly Bob 
has observed the outcome one as well. Okay, because we know I know in which context I am, so I this is just a deduction. Then if you think intercontextually, so if you think that there are values for kind of unperformed measurements that have to be specified, then you say, okay, but like I also know, then therefore it must have been the case that if I choose to measure one instead of zero, I would have obtained one. And similarly, if this is the case, then if Bob would have chose one instead of zero, he also would have obtained one. But then the outcome of my measurement has to be one. They have observed zero you know, at the beginning. So it's clear that this type of you know, intercontextual reasoning, so believing that there are values for a performed measurement is, uh, is wrong. It's, it's, a, it's a wrong type of reasoning. And in fact, this is a model that cannot arise from a distribution of global assignments. This is a very strong form of contextuality. It is not realizable in quantum theory as the contextual triangle is not realizable in quantum theory. This is a similar case when you have three measurements and three contexts choosing two out of three measurements. You know? So we have a context which is a zero, a two, a context which is a two, a one, a context which is a zero, a one. And uh, this is similar if you have an empirical model where the things are always anti-correlated and this you know, cannot arise from a global assignment of, of outcomes. Now, there are also kind of weaker form of contextuality, so kind of a more, not a strong contextuality, but a probabilistic contextuality, for example, the one actually realized by quantum theory in the Bell uh, scenario, the Bell, uh, for the, the famous Bell correlations, if you wish. So you cannot understand it directly only looking by, by uh, like only looking at the shape of the bundle diagram of the kind of possibilistic bundle diagram if you want, but you can prove, and of course, this is the content of, of Bell's theorem, but essentially you cannot describe, you cannot provide a deterministic assignment, uh, a mixture of deterministic assignment for all the, the four measurements, which will result in this assignment of, of outputs for this family of context, so for this specific empirical model. Um, but now the question is, where are where is the cover of context uh, coming from? Okay, really, like what, what does it mean? Um, so of course there are two possibilities, you know, either it is informed by the structure of some theory. So for example, certain measurements are commuting, you know, you know, you want to impose this, so you know, there must be some element of reality corresponding to performing both measurements together because they are commuting or they can be somehow informed by the causal structure of the background you know the background of the protocol itself um, of course the, the the first case is a bit weaker right because you can say that a particular description is contextual or non-contextual while the second one is more it's more uncontroversial because the context themselves are given by the causal structure of the protocol. So, so for example, um, you know, in the case, in the case of non-locality, in this, in this case over here, we have, uh, let's say that we have this n plus one uh, agents, they can all choose from a kind of a set of, uh, a set of possible measurements that they can perform in those sets here from I zero to, to I n. Uh, now, what do we say? We say that the set of all measurements is given by the disjoint union of all the possible local measurements. Okay, this is the set of all the possible measurements. And then the, the, the contexts, the contexts that arise from this, uh, for, for this, then for, for this example of, of, of locality or non-locality, are the subsets of the global measurements. And what are the global measurements? Well, it's an assignment of a specific choice of measurement for every agent, okay? So, so, the, so the context basically are all the subsets which contain at most one element of all those sets for each, for each agent, for each site. So, for example, in the, in the PR box, uh, the structure of the context arises from, you know, this, uh, assumption that the agent are space like separated the agent can either perform a0 a1 or b0 and b1 so we deduce this kind of structure of the contexts right for the contextual triangle 
uh, we cannot derive context in this way, you know, but we, we can say that you know, there is an event where an agent can either choose to perform a zero together with a two, and a, so it can, either perform, can either choose to perform a zero and a two together, a two or a one together, or a zero and a one together, you know, performs those measurements, uh, may like executes this protocol, many rounds of this protocol, and constructs the table that, that I was that I showed earlier. All right. In this case, you have to impose this um, this this description, the structure of the context. Okay. So now, what does it mean to kind of extend contextuality to situations which are signaling, you know, like uh, prima facie, it may seem that signaling is kind of antithetic to contextuality itself, you know, like, of course, like, if, if you have signaling, then you can, you can send some signal, so your choice of measurement will effectively affect the outcome of, you know, of, of other agents, in a way, so this is, of course, a form of contextuality. But what we need to do is we just need to be careful and describe the hierarchy of contexts uh, in such a way that it can be associated to protocols with a richer uh, causal structure. So in this case, the compatibility uh, will not embody non-disturbance or no signaling, but will embody a kind of more general principle of no signaling from the future somehow, right? So uh, Pula, sorry, I have just a quick question. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, is this so somewhat related, or maybe you connect to it later? There's like these uh, arrow of time constraints, and some of these um, people who do uh, look at contextuality as in terms of signaling and time, like Leggett Garg type experiments, they talk about these like arrow of time constraints, which uh, kind of say that the future can't signal to the past, but the, obviously the past can kind of influence the future. I don't know you. Uh, I didn't know if it was there was any relationship there or it's it's certainly related. In fact, in our paper, we use our, our framework to 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 also talk about Leggett Garg. Um, but uh, yeah, what we what we what we want to do is really to associate to a kind of uh, uh, like a, a kind of as as general as possible uh, causal description of, of, of the protocol, okay? Really when you, when you have, and we see also more general than just definite causal structures. When you have agents at each node, you know, imagine a kind of a distributed protocol, a distributed network of agents. And we want to study the correlations that arise, you know, from those networks and from this perspective of... of okay, of, yeah, I was just wondering the... the um... Yeah, no, no, it, it's certainly it's certainly related. In fact, uh, yeah, we if, if, if we're not going to talk about Leggett Card specifically, but we 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 study it in, in you know maybe I'm going to say something about it later as well. Okay, okay, thank you. So so what so so just to give you a kind of a very brief explanation of what I meant by this no, no signal from the future. It's very intuitive. Probably you already know it, but. So suppose that you have two agents, Alice and Bob, right? And Alice is allowed to signal to Bob. And they perform, I don't know, this kind of, you know, classically, uh, some uh, sort of classically controlled instrument. So they have, they, there is a set of possible interactions and they get some outcomes from this interaction, you know, locally. So we can start to play the same game and say, okay, let's say that the set of measurements is just the disjoint union of the set of inputs the input for Alice and the input for Bob. But then mm, there is a problem, right? Because I can take a subset of this disjoint union, which is, for example, given by all the measurements of A, which is a perfectly fine subset of the disjoint union. And I can ask you, does there exist a uh, you know, conditional distribution which relates the input and the outputs for, for, the, for Alice's box? And you say, yes, there is, it's well-defined, you know, it's enough to marginalize the outcome at Bob. And, you know, the input, the intervention at Bob will not change the conditional distribution at Alice's side, right? But then there is another subset of, of intervention, which is equally valid from a kind of mathematical perspective, which is, okay, just all the measurements at Bob's side, but this subset of measurement, you know, doesn't form a kind of a well-defined context, if you wish. 
Why? Because it uh, like the choices at of Afalis, the choices uh, like from the past of Bob can crucially affect the 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 conditional probability. Okay, so something like this uh, doesn't make sense. You have to provide information about what has happened in the past. Okay, so what we aim is to you know to capture topologically this property for a great variety of, of causal assumptions, even beyond the just stating causality. Um, it kind of you know, it already hints like it looks like you know kind of a Sierpinski space where there is uh, only one open set, which is you know A or A and B together, right? <clears throat> now, before we talk about uh, the kind of topological space, we need to talk about the combinatorics of, of, of these uh, causal scenarios in a way. So we need to represent, so we want to consider a topological space that represents the hierarchy of context for arbitrary causal structures. But we can say, okay, let's start with causal graphs, right? Causal graphs are uh, posted or pre-orders, if you want to be more general, describing uh, uh, space-like and time-like relations of events in, in space time. There is probably a missing word here. And uh, so something like this, right? We're seizing the past of Alice and Bob. But this is not exactly the combinatorial structure that we want. Uh, there are no inputs, you know, they don't include inputs. They're not very suitable to our operational study of causality. They are, you know, deterministic events, you know, which can be space-like or time-like separated. So first thing that we do before describing a topological space is we generalize the combinatories, the combinatorics of those uh, causal structures. And uh, how do we do so? The first thing, okay, we need to describe our canvas, the canvas on which we will define everything. And this is the notion of an operational scenario. So we have a, non a finite non-empty non set of, of events. And to every event, we just assign a set of inputs and a set of outputs, okay? So we can define uh, a notion of joint inputs and a notion of joint outputs. You know, it's well-defined, you take, just take one input for every event or one output for every event. Okay, so one measurement for it, one local measurement to one output. So this is, will be the, the canvas, an operational scenario. And uh, before I go on describing the actual structure, there is another piece of mathematical machinery. So I'm going to talk about partial functions. Uh, by partial functions, I really mean, you know, like, um, you have, you have a domain X, okay? And you specify some values to a subset of this domain, okay? But it can be parameterized by the elements of X. So it can be dependent on, on the elements on the, on the subset of the domain, right? Again, for simplicity, you can take this Y to be constant. And this is just the usual notion of partial functions. So we have this domain X and we assign to a subset of X, you know, some values of Y. So this mathematical object, those partial functions are partially ordered by restrictions, okay? We can say that F is smaller than G if the domain of F is contained in the domain of G and restricting G to the domain of F gives you back, you know, is equal to, to, to F itself, okay? If this happens, then we say that F is smaller than G. So there is already a kind of a partial order on these, uh, you know, abstract entities, which are partial functions. Now, this partial function from a formal lower semilattice with the empty function, which is its minimum, okay? And the meets are just given, okay, you take the intersection of the function. So you take the points where the values agree, okay? And you define the intersection to be just the, you know, the, 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 the function defines, defined on the common elements of the domain where the two functions agree. And we say that two partial functions are compatible where the domain of the meet, so this intersection, equals to the intersection of the two original domains, okay? So if, if really they are, two functions are compatible with they are, if, if they give the same value on uh, all the elements which are in the intersection of their domains, okay? So you can just, 
So if we have a set of compatible partial functions, we can join them together and form a join. We just glue them together. Okay, we take the union of their event when they are uh, of their entire event. You know, the, the, um, the gluing will be well defined because in the elements of they share, they, they have the same, they are defined the same way, right? And so you just glue together the partial function to obtain the join. But this join is defined only for compatible partial functions. And finally, with this, you know, uh, machinery in, in the back of our, our head, we can define a notion of, of input history, of spaces of input histories. And this is the important generalization of, uh, of, uh, of an order omega. So what you're basically doing is we are taking, okay, suppose that you have this, uh, um, you know, this scenario, this canvas of events, inputs and outputs, and you associate with a, a, an order, a pre-order or a post-it, okay? Let's say a pre-order to be general, which represents the causality. And now what you say, okay, you take your, the elements of your space of input histories will be given by all the time-like histories that are induced by the order omega. So what does it mean? You take an event, you look at all the events that, lies, that lie on, on its past, okay? And for all elements of the past, you associate one input. And this is one input history, okay? Given, the, given your order, you can reconstruct a collection, a, a, um, a set of those input histories. And those input histories will inherit the partial order of uh, partial functions. So what you get is a partial order defined from the, the order omega and a choice of inputs to every event, which is our space of input histories. And this is really the kind of combinatorial structure that captures this you know, uh, uh, operational notion of, of, of causality. An example, we have three events, A, B, and C. They are totally ordered. Uh, so A is before B, B is before C, okay? You look at the down set, which in, in this case corresponds to the lower set because it's a linear order. So you look, okay, what are the elements uh, covered by A? So uh, it, it's only A itself, right? What are the elements in the past of B? Is B and A. What are the elements in the past of C? A, B, and C. So you have those three sets. You associate with the possible uh, choice of inputs. And what you construct, what you extract, is this space of input histories over here this partial order, okay? So this is the partial order that we associate to definite causal scenarios. Uh, to, in particular, this is a poset. You can also define it for pre-orders. So when thing, two things are in the same kind of causal cl class, you know, and it's not possible to say that B is in the past of C, but this is kind of trivial. It's a kind of trivial generalization. You just have two downsets and the space of histories which we look we look like this, right? If to the event, there is just one choice, if the events are kind of deterministic, so only one thing can happen, then what you do, you recover the standard partial order, you know? Like the order of the space of histories will just be the original uh, order we started with. So it's really a generalization. But this, you know, having more space, adding the inputs, uh, it's important because it also allows us to define type of spaces which capture notions such like uh, indefinite causality. So you can pick your, your histories, you know, from the partial function in such a way that they do not arise from a space of histories for a particular causal order, okay? But they represent situations where, for example, the causal order is determined by Alice. So Alice, in, like with, with her choice, can choose the causal order between Bob and Charlie. And this is the kind of causal order that would, would emerge. You know? It's like you know, uh, going beyond determinism, we are in this domain where we actually describe uh, the combinatorial structure which are kind of richer you know, than, than normal causal order or causal pre-orders. 
Okay. Now, we want to provide a kind of an axiomatic description of the spaces which are spaces of histories which are nice, so which correspond to a kind of to, to kind of some causal assumptions. They turn out to be all kind of very nice. The only thing that you have to impose is there are two, two properties. I'm going to tell you the first one, which is just join uh, primality. So the fact that you know the space, the histories that you choose are somehow prime. Okay, you cannot form uh, another history by joining two of the histories. Okay, by having two histories which are compatible and you can just join them. Okay, you cannot form a kind of. Uh, I mean, I mean, you, 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 you can do it only in the case if one is totally contained inside of the other one, okay? But you cannot do it in general. So this is this notion of joint primality. And, uh, and this defines a space of input histories, which we call theta. We also have an extended version. There is a duality, which will turn out to be very important in the work. There is the space of input histories, and there is the extended space of input histories, which is just the joint closure in the space of partial functions. Okay, And this joint primality guarantees that there is a kind of bijective correspondence between the joint closure of the space of the histories in the space of, of, uh, of partial functions and uh, join prime spaces of input histories. Another thing that we want to impose, and uh, it's going to be imposed, in, of course, in the rest of this presentation, it's that those input histories satisfy a kind of free choice condition. So what does it mean? It means that the histories, the time-like histories of your scenarios are so chosen, so given, that you can construct all the possible joint inputs you know, by gluing the histories together, by gluing the compatible histories in the original space together. So if in the extended space of histories, okay, there exist the, the basically the total functions over the sets of events, right? You can see, you can see here. Let's let's take an example. So this is a space of valid space of histories. This is a space of extended histories. Let's look at this A zero B one C zero. Okay, uh, this is obtained by gluing together the histories. I, I, excuse me, Nicole. I have a question. Uh, could you also just say briefly how this operation of extension works from left to right? I think the gray ones are the extensions, right? So how how does that work roughly? How do you get the gray ones? Uh, so, so you're, you're, you're asking me to, to say how this extension works. Yes. Uh, so those elements of theta, they are um, partial functions. Okay. You can take those partial functions and just add the, 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 the joins, okay, in the spaces of partial functions. Okay. And all the joins that you can construct give you the extended version of the space. Okay, so for example, B0 and C0 are clearly compatible. So you join them and you get B0, C0, right? Or A1, or, or for example, this one that I was explaining now, A0, B1, and C0, okay? It can be obtained by joining together the histories A0, B1, and A0, C0, okay? They are compatible because they agree on their common event A, okay? A0, B1, it's already in the space of histories, okay? While A0 and C0 can be obtained by joining together A0 and C0, which are also in the space of histories, okay? So when this procedure generates all the joint inputs for a scenario, then we say that the space of input history satisfies the free choice condition. It's basically saying that you can take those, you know, you really should think about those histories as, as you know, uh, Time like uh, uh, you know time like histories that can occur in, in our scenario, and this is basically saying you know the the extension the extended space allows you to glue together the compatible time like histories, and the free choice condition is telling you that by gluing together appropriately the those time like histories, you eventually can get all the possible joint inputs. Okay, so this is really a kind of a free choice uh, conditions somehow, right? That there is a way to obtain all the possible uh, 
uh, uh, kind of joint inputs in an operational scenario, you know, like joining together those time-like stories. Okay, so so this is what we have. We have a set of those partial functions, okay, defined on this uh, global domain of events, okay, which satisfy the free choice condition and they are uh, joint prime. Oh, so did I do? Okay. So if you have normal causal orders, Okay, then can be ordered by inclusion. It's very simple as well, two pre-orders and say when one is containing the other one. Okay, you just uh, check out the, the set of set of elements if one is included in the other one. And also the relationship of the first pre-order are all included in the relationship of the other one. Then you can say that they are ordered, right? That one is smaller than the other one. With basis of histories per se, this doesn't work. Okay, because um, you cannot just say, you know, this inclusion, you know, those are the set of histories. You can see this is the, 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 set, of, the set of histories where the event A is in the past of B and C. Okay, and it's, um, it takes a while to, to check that this is the case, or this timeline histories where A is in the past of B and C, and all the events are uh, kept by a kind of dichotomic choice of measurement. And this is the case of the total order, the familiar space of histories for the total order. This causal fork, when you have A, uh, you know, before B and C, but B and C are space like separated, should really be contained inside the total order somehow, right? It just contains more causal assumptions of you know, the, the fact that uh, B and C are space like separated. But as, as causal order, uh, one is smaller than the other one. So we want this order to extend on, on input histories, also adding the kind of general spaces that we get, you know, so indefinite causality and stuff like that. It turns out that in order to do so, you have to go to the extended version, okay? So the inclusion of spaces of input histories is witnessed, is witnessed by, by their extended spaces. Okay, so we can talk about when a space of history is, is a causal refinement of another one, or when a space of history is, is a causal coarsening of the other one by looking at their extended histories, essentially, right? There is something that uh, I forgot, I want to go back. We were looking at this space earlier, right? You may say, okay, but what does this mean? Like it's a strange space, isn't it? Um, well, let's try to understand what is going on. So A is always in the past here but what can happen crucially is like uh, bob and charlie will be in the future of, of a but they can choose to disconnect themselves ca ca causally so if bob chooses to do zero uh, he can choose to kind of disregard everything in the past and similarly charlie if he chooses zero he can choose to disconnect himself from the past of the other two events this is also an operational possibility, a causal operational possibility, which is captured by this you know, combinatorial description of, of causality. It's, a, it's just a causal refinement of the total order, in effect, right? So let's, uh, let's see how this hierarchy looks, for example, for, for free events. So this is not the full uh, hierarchy of all spaces of input histories. Uh, this is the hierarchy for the spaces which we call uh, causally complete. So, for example, they, not they don't arise from situations like a pre-order, okay, when you have certain events which are in the same equivalence class in a way. There are 102 causally complete spaces and uh, um, equivalence classes of causally complete spaces. So, for example, you know, if you like, like up to kind of permutations of the agents or permutations of, of the inputs. Okay. And this is really the kind of the structure, right? The, 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 the non locality one lies at the bottom, is the ones which is more causally constrained. There are more causally constraints there because everything has to be no signaling. Okay. And at the top, you have the causally definite ABC. 
and the causal switch, okay, where Alice chooses the order. And then, of course, there are others, but they are not causally complete. So, for example, the space of histories for the uh, indiscrete pre-order, where everything is in a single equivalence class, right? But now we have those uh, sp spaces of input histories, those kind of combinatorial structures. We need to define topologies on them, and this is going to be our this is going to be our topology of contexts, really. What we do is very simple. These spaces of input histories are partial order. So we just take the lower sets to be the open sets of our topology. It's a kind of dual of the Alexander topology, if you wish. And this, like every open set, so, so in this case, you know, what happened is that the histories, the timeline histories be, are our, the points of our topology, right? And the open sets are, uh, uh, you know, the lower sets of the spaces of histories. And uh, so the idea now is the following, that we associate causal data to those open sets, you know? So it's, it's, it's uh, the, uh, kind of an identical procedure to the one that uh, with the standard kind of shift theoretic approach, right? We, we, were, we had to define a, a sheaf, which was describing the possible Cause the possible classical data that you put that you put on the top of your subset of measurements. Now this classical data, these values of those hidden variables, will be causal functions. Will be functions which which respect a particular causal constraint. But we define them. We we define this the, the possible causal data for every lower set of a space of histories. Okay, not just every subset of the measurements, but every lower set of the of the spaces of histories. Um, so, what is a classical causal explanation? Where well, a classical causal explanation will be one which is defined over the entire. You know, where when you take the cover, you're just taking all your histories and you are associating causal data to all your histories. Okay, but something like I don't know a, a, a causal. Uh, uh, protocol, so a quantum protocol, okay, will be uh, something to which we can assign a causal mechanism, a causal explanation to a certain uh, family, a certain cover of this topology, okay, but such that th th it will not be possible to extend this assignment to a kind of global causal uh, description, okay, over all the, the histories. So in this case, this also this it's clear how to, you know you see this fine tuning as you know the idea that well you know classical causality fails because effectively we are describing we are describing causal uh, um, causal data, but uh, but only inside each given context. Okay, we cannot do it globally. You know, the, a global assignment, a global description will fail. And so what does it mean? Uh, what, when is a function causal? You know? um, because we want to assign functions to these lower sets. Okay? When is a function causal? Well, we know what, what, what does it mean to be causal for kind of a, a general, uh, so this is a particular space of histories. Like, and uh, uh, so this is usually what the literature refers to a causal function. Okay? It's a function from the join input and the join output, okay? such that the value at some event can only depend on the event which are in the past of that event. Okay. So a function which satisfies this property, it's usually it's considered you know a causal kind of deterministic assignment of data given some joint inputs. What we do in our paper is realize that uh, this causality can be rephrased in a mathematically more pleasant uh, description of continuity. And really causal functions are just the functions coincide. And so this is also allows us to generalize the notion of, of causal functions, right? They, they coincide with, uh, with uh, functions which are continuous that go from the extended input histories to the partial functions on the output. 
okay? Those, those spaces are all equipped with a lower set topology. And then you can rephrase this causality condition with continuity. And what you realize also is that a lower set, so an open set in a space of input histories, turns out to be a valid space of input histories. But then it's perfect, right? Because we know what causal functions are for a space of input histories. We know, we know that lower set of histories, which, uh, which are open sets, are also valid spaces of input histories. So we can define the assignment of our causal data. We can define you know, the, the sheaf curly E in the standard uh, Abramsky, Abramsky language. Now asking Brandenburger. So this is basically what we do, you know, like I'm just gonna, so we assign to every context, so to every open set of our topology, the topology is given by, you know, by the lower set of the spaces of histories, we assign those causal function, you know, those local causal functions, okay? Then we do the, uh, uh, this turns out to be a shift for, uh, uh, for a, a, a big family of spaces of input histories. Not all, there are some complications, but uh, as we explained in the paper, but for the majority of, of the spaces, which, which have a kind of clear operational uh, meaning, uh, this is just a shift, like we would expect, you know, we just assign uh, deterministic data, the values of this hidden variable to the, to the context. Now, so you post-compose this with the distribution monad, and what you get is a definition of distributions of causal functions, okay? That can be assigned to every open set of this, of this topology of histories. There is one thing that is missing, right? We haven't discussed covers. So in the Abramsky and Brandenburger framework, so they were saying, okay, there is this set of measurements. And then what you do is you select a family of contexts, you know, which are the one of interest, okay? This family of contexts, okay, are nothing else than a cover for the power set topology in the original framework. Here we have changed the power, the topology, the underlying topology to reflect the, you know, the fact that these contexts have some structure. So, so, uh, so a compatible, so a, so a family, so a, a family of, of contexts of interest will always be, you know, a cover of our topological space. So an empirical model will be defined by a cover on, on, on the top of this topological space, okay? And then compatibility, uh, co compatibility will, uh, uh, co compatibility with respect to this cover will coincide with you know empirical models which are causal for a given causal assumption, you know, which are compatible with a given causal assumption. But when you talk about causality in particular, you always have in mind a particular cover of the space, which is, for example, the one that uh, that we chose when discussing PR scenarios. Uh, popescu uh, boxes, right? So the context uh, that were implied by the causal structure. Here also, a space of input histories will have a kind of preferred cover, which we call the standard cover. Okay. And this preferred cover eventually uh, is nothing else than telling you, okay, your empirical models, your table of conditional probabilities, that you, that you want that describe, you know, the compatible families for the cover, they just look like they are indexed by the global inputs. You know, they are just table of probabilities indexed by the global inputs. However, for a, for a, for a kind of space of input histories, there are many possible open covers, right? Like it's just a normal topological space. So this is an example which can be described with the standard shift theoretic approach. It's just one event and three choices of, of measurement, if you want. And there are nine possible cover, okay? And this, 
And the space here, the topological space of histories is isomorphic to the power set of the free events. So everything squares. Similarly, the, the no signaling, which is also, which can also be described with the standard shift theoretic machinery, all the covers will look like this, you know. And 42 is the standard cover. So the one which you where the assumption is only given, the, 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 the structure of the context is only given by causality, right? When you have to really this kind of uh, join inputs, one for every space like separated agent. In this case, there are only two agents. And then there is, you see, there is an entire hierarchy of cover, which are, because cover can be coarser or finer, right? And there is an entire family of covers, which are coarser than the standard one, and this is an this this represents an entire family of so this represents uh, an entire um, uh, you know hierarchy of classicality because this one is the global cover so if you attach data here you are attaching classical data you're describing classical scenarios you know but coarse like finer cover than the global cover but coarser than the and the standard cover will represent different uh, assumption of classicality on an entire hierarchy. And for example, this is the space of covers for a particular space of histories, you know, which is not, uh, which for example, cannot be described by, by the Bransky and Brandenburg framework in particular because it includes causality, right? A is before B, but B is basically, B can decide to, uh, causally separate from A when he chooses zero. This induces, a stand, it has a standard cover, of course, and there is an entire family of covers above the standard cover and below the standard cover, right? But interesting, this one is the classical cover. So whenever, so an empirical model which is compatible with the causal scenario will be, a, you know, a compatible assignment of of, uh, of elements to this cover, okay? But then you ask, is this actually classical? It's the same as asking, well, can this be lifted to the classical cover, you know? And can, can we say that five is recovered from a section in the classical cover, you know? From all the elements that are in five. So these, for example, the covers for the total order AB, of course, there are, there are many, right? And, and in this case, the standard cover turns out to be the finer cover that you can choose. And this is the classical one. But this is only because we are talking, this is a specific case of a total order between the events. Now, this was the kind of topology part, just now very briefly. Um, what do we mean by geometry? Well, to every space of input histories and a choice of cover, we can associate a polytope. Polytope of the empirical model, okay, which are compatible, which are you know compatible families of section for that cover. And if we only focus on the standard cover, okay, so we are only performing standard causal reasoning without assuming additional. Uh, uh, you know, um, contextuality requirement without assuming that certain uh, measurements commute, stuff like that. If you're only taking the standard cover, um, then with respect to a, to, to a set of events, okay, all those causal topes, so one for every, um, you know, space of, of input history is compatible with a set of events, okay, we form a polytope and those polytopes live in the same ambient space. So you can ask questions, you know, you can say, okay, you have an empirical model, which is a point in this ambient space. And you can ask how much of this empirical model is uh, explained by one causal assumption? How much is it explained by another causal assumption? You can causally decompose the model. Okay, you can perform some causal reasoning inside this thing. In particular, we can we generalize a notion which in the community of causality is kind of is, is very dear in a way, which is the notion of causal inequalities. Uh, because 
we, we have this kind of general idea that an empirical model is causally separable with respect to a space of histories, okay, when it lies in the convex hull of the causal completion for the space of history. So the space of history can be causally incomplete. So it can, for example, come from a pre-order. But then you ask, okay, but like how many causally well-defined uh, spaces with a well-defined causality, uh, how much you can decompose the model in terms of spaces with, with a well-defined causality, which lies under this uh, general space theta, you know? You can ask questions like this. So a kind of causal separability with respect to some assumption. If this is the indiscrete pre-order, for example, this is the same as satisfying causal inequalities. But why is this important? Because everything that we've done so far gives us a device independent approach to, to study causality, but also to discover new phenomena in a way. So consider this uh, implementation of a, of a specific empirical model. We have a causal switch. I don't know if you are familiar with it, but for, for people who are familiar. And uh, in uh, like the control of this, of this, in the control of this switch, we put one side of an entangled state. Okay. On the other side, we have Daniel, which is controlling uh, the other side of the entangled state. And then Charlie, which is kind of measuring the control that comes out of the switch. If you just ask, does this thing violate causal inequalities? The answer is no. But why? Because causal inequalities are very general. They ask for causal decomposition that can have any kind of uh, causal order between the events. You know, Daniel can be uh, in, the, in the past, in the future of Charlie. You know, and of course, you can always concur and find out a, a description of the protocol in, in, in that way, right? However, if you impose some uh, pre-assumption, you know, so, okay, this is the same empirical model written with colors, which reveals some structure, but, so if you assume that there is some causal structure, so that at least Daniel is space-like separated, okay? So you take this space of histories and you say, okay, I want to see if the model, this model here, it's decomposable with respect to the completion. So the space of histories, which are uh, beneath this one and are, uh, which are compatible with this one, but are complete causally, this is not complete because the events A and B are in the same class. So you ask your question, does it lie in the convex hull of the spaces of the polytopes of the causal top generated as by, space of, by, by spaces of input histories describing complete histories? And the answer is no. Okay. So what you get is effectively, um, uh, you see like it's, you, you run the software, it tells you that it's explained 40% by the A before B before C and Daniel space like separated and 40% by Bob before Alice before Charlie and Daniel space like separated. But uh, the general causal order is somehow contextual, right? Because it cannot be decomposed. It cannot, it doesn't lie in the convex hull of those two polytopes. So the causal order cannot be, we, can, we cannot think that the causal order arises from a, from a, from a hidden variable you know, that describes the order somewhere, it's not present, it's not there. It's, it's, it's kind of genuinely indefinite. And this can happen when using the quantum switch. So this is a device independent, uh, um, you know, verification of indefinite causality. And interestingly, this causal separability, they look this, you, you can try to, you know, perform different measurements for Charlie and Daniel, and they look very similar to the contextual fraction. Try this for the Bell state, for the GHZ state, or for two switches. So you know, you really like you have protocols where the causality itself is a contextual variable, right? And yeah, this is one use of, of our framework. It, it really unifies a lot. Like it unifies the discussion about contextuality uh, with uh, with with causality, indefinite causality. So it's a powerful language because it unifies a lot of you know of, of things that. You know, researchers in quantum foundations are really interested in. Um, but yeah, it's it's a big work, so I could speak for for ages. But uh, for now, let me let me stop here. So.
uh, yeah, this is the paper on the archive if you want to check it out. Uh, no clarifications or anything, just letting me know. I'm always more than happy to talk about this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I did a premature clap. Uh, I'll clap again now. <laughs> um, so any questions uh, from the audience? Um, usually, hopefully not too shy today. Um, okay, yeah, so I had some more, uh, I guess not tangential, just uh, this is a broad field with connections in various uh, ways. So have people who uh, reached out to you or uh, has anyone talked to you about like gravity and the like relationship to that kind of work or because um, people are doing all sorts of stuff with causal order in relationship to gravity as well, but this is sort of a tangentially related like field of research, it feels like. Yes, in fact, uh, so like, uh, yeah, I think I think that this could be could, could, could be really important if, if, if we take it, if we take it to this direction, to that direction, uh, because really what we have here is a you know kind of witnessing of of, of indefinite causality, uh, and what we had is that causal inequalities were not enough to witness indefinite causality, but it's not a surprise because of its generality, you know, because of they were too coarse grained. Uh, you know, you were missing a crucial assumption. So the fact that, you know, you, you can add certain causal assumption and only ask for causal separability with respect to, you know, the causal completions of, uh, of, of a causal order which you, know, which you know is satisfied. You know, whenever you are talking about contextuality, you always have to define your, the, the assumptions which shape the context, right? And uh, the context were not shaped enough in the context in in the, in the sorry for the game of words, but in the in the field of you know causal discoveries. I mean that. Oh, yeah. I was. So, just, it was just more curiosity. Um, so so yeah, I really I really do believe that uh, that this could be used as a, as a you know verification or you know the kind of theory independent study and description of what indefinite causality is. Uh, can whatever it means, that? like whatever, like I don't know if, uh, well, yeah, whatever that means. In fact, yeah. I don't know if the switch is something that exists, you know, like, but uh, sure. if you want to extend your quantum theory, to, because of order. Yeah, can I clarify that point? Because I had read about the quantum switch maybe a year or two ago. Um, that that's not the quantum switch is something that's act. Uh, maybe this is going to sound not smart, but uh, is it something that's quantum realizable? Is there actually like a sort of protocol you can do within quantum theory? Or why do I remember it re needing like... Um, it depends what you mean. Like, yeah. um, like you know, um, it, it really depends on what you mean by this. So uh, like, I would be more interested, you know, in, in studying the quantum switch from a perspective of, you know, where... Uh, uh, Ah, oh, you, you know, you space mean, and space uh, in itself is really indefinite somehow, but. Uh... Ah, okay, I see what you mean. Uh, but when so this is Giulio Cirabella's right that that was something that he started up. If I'm not mistaken, what in just the original papers did it require just standard quantum theory or did he uh, was it designed with something else? This is maybe not neither here nor there. I was just trying to. No, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Like it's it's uh, they they described it initially as a kind of super map. Yeah. So you know, as a, an action that you can do on uh, on quantum channels. You know, you can yeah. take two quantum channels and put them in a superposition. Okay. Mm -hmm. By itself, is not. I mean, it's not known or. Uh, that, if this thing is really something that you can do, in fact, uh, you know, with the, the operational consequences, that they are not so so clear or kind of. I see. Uh, okay. But this is the, the, the my, my work. It's not inside a specific theory. You know, it's not a, like this is theory independent in sense. Uh, just the correlation themselves exhibit a form of causality which is contextual. So if you observe those correlations, then you have to explain them somehow. You know, you have to. What is really going on? Like, is it, you know, something is really indefinite here? Yeah, yeah. No, that that's. I was. I, 
I was kind of more just using you as my uh, quick Wikipedia page. I apologize. Oh, no, yeah. I, it wasn't like directly related to the work that you did. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and could you also just clarify this one thing for me that maybe I, I did, it went over my head, which was, uh, so with the sheaf theoretic approach uh, to contextuality, there are these like hierarchies and maybe you said this, but I it just maybe it went over my head. Uh, you have like the bell sort of like probabilistic sort of um, contextuality. You had Hardy, logical, and then like GHC. Uh, there is something like this for uh, the construction of these. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 absolutely, it's absolutely identical. I see. It's identical. You just generalize. You are just generalizing the topology. So you're gen you, have, you now have different. So every causal tope. You know, yeah. every causal tope. So every polytope arising from a choice of a cover and space of histories has an associated classical uh, mm -hmm. polytope inside of it, right? I see. So you can you can study you can study the contextuality there, which is different from the contextual causality that I was talking about, right? Yeah. But you can study, you can always perform those studies of contextuality, you can quantify contextuality with respect to certain polytopes really generalize the notion it's a direct generalization of everything everything follows through in fact like the type of um, uh, you know mathematical generality offered by category theory allows you basically to take uh, almost uh, any theory in the original paper by abramsky and brandenburger and extend it to to our topologies i see it's uh, um, uh, any other uh, questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have a question. If I'm not cutting off. Uh, oh, okay, uh, so uh, probably, uh, so, so can you also construct like categories of empirical models in this context as well, like morphisms between? Uh, yeah, it's something that we haven't, uh, we haven't looked at. Uh -huh. um, you know, like, um, but, but they know that, you know, the people working on shift theory are working on you know, categories of empirical models and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see, you know, what are the categorical properties arising from uh, the construction that they have here. Maybe, you know, how, how they are different from, from the categories where you eventually stop at the level of non-locality or single events, which is, you know, the standard shift theoretic approach. Maybe it's, it has a rich, a different categorical structure. Uh, that would be also interesting. But we haven't looked at it. It's really... I see. Okay. Yeah, I think I was, uh, I mean, thank you very much for the presentation. I think overall it gave me a very good idea so that I can go to the paper and study, <laughs> uh, things in more, more depth. Uh, so, the, so the other question, which I mean, probably I'm going to look at it myself, but maybe you already did. So did you uh, try to apply this framework to, um, to understand contextuality as a computational resource? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. I uh, myself haven't. Okay. But uh, a lot of people are asking this, and uh, it feels natural, right? Because what they yeah, do, yeah. what they do when they, you know, when they studied, uh, you know, for example, the advantage given by uh, quantum shallow circuit and stuff like that, mm -hmm. they really want to capture contextuality. But to do so, you have to get rid of uh, of, of signaling somehow, right? Um, in this framework, you don't get rid of signaling. I mean, uh, it's accommodates signaling so so yeah I'd be really interested if, if something can be said about this and uh, oh. I, I think it can be yeah so so one, one of them is shallow circuits but the other thing that i had in mind was the uh, mdqc uh measurement yeah. based quantum computing right strong contextuality can be seen as a resource but the thing is uh, people have studied the temporally flat version you, know, you can also make the measurements depend on previous measurements, and that case has not been understood. How contextuality arises as a resource in that context, and I, I thought like this framework is already a natural since it's a natural extension of uh, sheep theoretic version uh, formulation of contextuality it can be like maybe uh, used to extend the early results in that in that context. So that's, that's yeah, very I'm very interesting, very interesting, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think it was a very nice talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank yes. you.